So kids say the funniest things, don't they? <laughs> so Jack is two and a half now. And uh, so his personality is just really beginning to blossom, might be the best way to say that. And, uh, of course, kids, you know, they don't really understand what's awkward, what's not, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And uh, he, so he repeats things that he's, he's heard, uh, you know, back to us. And so just the other day, you know, Erica was getting ready in the morning, and um, uh, Jack was in the room, and, and, and Jack said to her, Mommy, don't poop on the rug. Because <laughs> we've had to tell Jack that. You know, and then the other day, he, he told me not to uh, pee in my underwear. <laughs> so, pearls of wisdom from, from, from little Jack. And it's because maybe, maybe because kids will say the most inappropriate, the most awkward things, right? They talk about poop and pee, and it doesn't bother them. Maybe it's reasons like that, that the disciples of Jesus decide to not let the children come to, come to Jesus. I don't know. Maybe it is. But, but here's the story in Luke, okay? Uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17 say, Now, people were even bringing their babies to him, that is Jesus, for him to touch. But when the disciples saw it, they began to scold those who brought them. But Jesus called for the children, saying, Let the little children come to me, do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never, never enter it. Now, the passage, the, the, the characters of the passage is talking about children coming to Jesus, but the heart behind the message are people coming to faith in Christ. Don't do not hinder anyone coming to faith in Jesus, right? So that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about today is about, about the hindering of people coming to church or coming to a faith in, in Christ. So I have a, I have a question for you. Uh, do you all want to see a revival in our land? Yeah, show of hands. Come on, let's get them up there. All right. Yeah, hopefully we all have our hands up. That's an easy one. Here's a harder one to answer, maybe. Who's expecting a revival to happen? Yeah, some, uh, not as many hands, still significant, but not as many, right? And so uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's been a history of revivals in the United States. About every 50 to 60 years, we hit a revival, and it starts back with what's called the First Great Awakening. It happened in the 1730s and 40s, and that was led by some great preachers like Jonathan Edwards going around the frontier, preaching, bringing all kinds of people to, to faith. And that lasted, you know, 20, maybe 30 years or so. Uh, John Wesley was involved in all of that as well. And then about, in, in about around 1800 or so, the second great awakening occurs, and that lasts till about 1830, give or take. And, uh, and that's where our movement of churches, the Restoration Church, the Christian churches, the churches of Christ, that's where we come from. And the second great awakening to this day is still the largest revival that our land has ever seen. And then in 1906, we had what was called the Azusa Street Revival, and all kinds of offshoots of that occurred, and that's where we received a lot of the Pentecostal movement, uh, kind, of come, kind of comes from that movement. And then, of course, maybe what we're more all for, and that lasts for about 10 years, uh, but what we're all probably more familiar with is uh, the Billy Graham Crusades of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, right? And that that was probably what we're all really familiar with. And, and, and during those revivals throughout our history, they estimate that about 40, maybe not quite 40 million people came to faith in Christ during all of that. And if you do the math, we're due, right? We're about due for another revival. If you count the years on the calendar, we should be expecting one. However, 
Since about 1992, the United States has lost about 40 million churchgoers. Two researchers have come to call this the great de-churching. And for the first time since Gallup kept track, which goes back 80 years, more adults do not attend church in our country than do. For the first time in our, in our nation's history. So to give a bit of perspective about how steep of a decline that is since 1992, you take all of the revivals that our land has experienced since 1730, add up all the people that were added to the church from that, more people have walked away since 1992 than all of the people that have come to Christ through those revivals. That's, that's very weighty, isn't it? Now, for many of you, this is not a matter of statistics. This is a matter of real life. And maybe your children, your grandchildren, your siblings, loved ones, coworkers, are part of that de-churched where they might still have faith in God, but they're not attending church anywhere. They might be walking away. And the fear of the, of the book uh, called The Great De-Churching is that the children of the de-churched become the unchurched, meaning there is no faith. And when there is no faith, you can have no revival. What are you reviving? And so there is a, uh, a call for revival in our, in our lands. So the question I want to ask today for us to seek an answer to is, how can we be a church that does not hinder people from coming to God? And maybe put it a different way, how can we be a church that is prepared and ready for a revival? Well, we are continuing a series of sermons uh, today called The Trail Guide to Glory, where we are following Jesus on his journey to glory. So in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it, the text says, Now when the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set out resolutely to go to Jerusalem. And he will enter into glory by coming into the city of Jerusalem. Hosanna, Hosanna, right? And he will have glory on the cross as he endures his passion. And of course, there's death and burial and resurrection glory. And then where we will end on Easter is his ascension, ascending into his ultimate glory. And that's the journey that we've been on. And along the way, Jesus has some instructions or some trail tips, some trail guide tips, right? And, uh, and last week we looked at do not be anxious and do not fear. And today we're looking at do not hinder, do not hinder. Because the church is in a precarious situation that has been slowly building for the last 30 years. And then in COVID, what seems like all at once became overwhelmed by the de-churching. But hear me, we can be a church that does not hinder revival in our land if we embrace exile, extend hospitality, and endorse reconciliation. Did you get those three? Embrace exile, extend hospitality, and endorse reconciliation. That's where we will be going today, but first, let's pray. God in heaven, the Lord of hosts, we gather today to celebrate you and your work. We can do nothing without, nothing good without your spirit. We can do nothing praiseworthy without your love. You are the author and finisher of our faith. We come to you in the name of Jesus, the one who conquered death on our behalf. Reveal to us how we can better lead others to you and not hinder the lost soul. May this message, the words of my mouth, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you are our strength. You are our redeemer. Get glory in this place. And all God's people said, Amen. If you have your Bible or Bible apps, we will be hopping around today. We will begin first in Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. And if you find your way there, 
It will be up on the screens. Jeremiah is writing to the Israelites. We're hopping back in time when Israel is carried off into exile in Babylon. And God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah, and he has some things, uh, some heavy messages for the people of Israel to hear. Listen to the words of the prophet. He says, The Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all those he sent into exile to Babylon from Jerusalem, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and allow your daughters to get married so that they too can have sons and daughters. Uh, Grow in number, do not dwindle away. Work to see that the city where I sent you as exiles enjoys peace and prosperity. Pray to the Lord for it. For as it prospers, you will prosper. If we were to hop over back into the New Testament and we came to the book of, say, I don't know, 1 Peter, we would find there that his book begins with the words to the exiles who are in the empire, who are scattered throughout the empire of the world, right? God's people have always kind of taken on this identity of being exiles exiles. It goes all the way back to Abraham, right? They were, they were exiles in Egypt. They were exiles to the Philistines. They were exiles to Babylon and Persia and the Greeks and to uh, the great enemy Rome and then to the Turks and all the people that have come after them. God's people continuously have had to endure periods of exile. And the message for the people of exile is to get comfortable settle in, and seek out the good of the city. Now, this is not desiring persecution or, or, or abandoning the public square by any means. We aren't saying that if we're going to embrace exile, then that, that means we must remove ourselves from culture. We're not saying that, that at all. On contrary, we are engaging the culture on a different level using different methods. We need to recognize that the path ahead of us is not necessarily one that's gained through political power or influence, but one of salt and light, of humility. Remember, Rome was changed by the church before the church ever had any political or power or influence over the people. It was changed by reaching one person at a time. And that is the strategy that we must embrace. You see, the legislation of morality is not the method of the kingdom. The method of the kingdom is loving your neighbor as yourself. It's being that salt and light that permeates culture, that permeates people, and is preserving them in the faith. And God's people have been doing this since Abraham. He does his best work. God does his best work when his people are in exile. Joe Matthews is the co-founder of the Ecumenical Institute of Chicago, which he uh, formed in the middle of the 20th century, coming to terms with this idea of embracing exile, a change in strategy. His strategy was to mark off one square mile around their building complex, and they were going to do everything they could for the people within that one square mile. If somebody needed clothing, they would give them clothes. If they needed shelter, they could stay with them. If they needed uh, food, they would feed them. If they needed legal help, they would send lawyers to go help them. You see, they sought out the shalom or the peace of Chicago, because what is good for Chicago is good for God's people. As long as it's God's peace. And so he, he wanted to, uh, Joe wanted to awaken those principles of preservation of culture in the city. Those, those same principles that led Daniel to, to, serve the, to, to serve Babylon or the church to transform Rome. We must take up and embrace the fact that we are in exile because when we do, we seek and pray for the peace of our land. For you note-takers, we seek and pray for the peace of our land. 
See, exile is not an admission of defeat, but it is a shift in strategy. Think bottom up, not top down. The the public square, it's hostile to us. We know this, right? We know that our beliefs are not desired or wanted or sought out. They're, they want us to be quiet and be, and be kept in the corner, but that does not mean that we are hostile back. We should not be hostile back. We, we never cower from the truth. We stand firm on our principles. We live out our values, and we live out our faith. But our strategy ought to be change, pers- uh, change the world one person at a time by making disciples who can make disciples. So this means that we love those who may look different. We, we love those who behave different, who speak different, and yes, even smell different than us. But our faith calls for empathy because we are all children of God. Therefore, we need to extend hospitality to our neighbors. Hop over, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, because Paul has some things to say about hospitality. Starting in verse 3, the apostle writes, Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility... Be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Each of you should be concerned not only about your own interests, but the interests of others as well. You see, our interests should be turning the de-churched into the re-churched, right? We need to love others with hospitality by inviting our neighbors into our lives with the purpose to serve them, regardless of what they look like, of, what they, of how they talk, of how they behave, because that's what God has called us to do. The authors of the book, The Great Dechurching, said that 50% of the dechurched evangelical, uh, evangelicals would return to the church with a simple invitation. Here's their quote. They said, some people need a nudge. Others need a dinner table, and others need years of patient and prayerful, consistent movement into their lives. You see, what Paul is saying here is that we need to prioritize simple conversations and witnesses in our neighborhoods. We need to witness in our schools, in our places of business, in our families. We need to stand on the truth of the gospel, but live out the gospel as well as we love people and we love them uh, back, to, back to church, back to Jesus. Because people out there are living out in what's you know, the real world, right? They don't see the, uh, the, the, the cosmic war between, between God and the enemy. All they see is the world in front of them. They're just trying to make their way in the world, especially the poorest and less fortunate among us, like fast food workers. Last last September, Rosemary Hain of Ohio, uh, undoubtedly an emotionally unstable woman, overreacted to how her burrito at Chipotle was made. Or present it to her, or I don't know, all right? So she's in, a, she's in her local Chipotle ordering her, you know, burrito bowl, or, you know, whatever you get there, and then she sees it in front of her, and she works herself into this frenzy, and she takes her burrito bowl, and she throws it back in the face of the store manager. I mean, I've had some bad fast food service, but I've never felt like I should throw my food back in their face. Well, this woman, of course, it's the, you know, 21st century, so everything is recorded on camera. So, you know, phones, security footage, they track down this woman. It's not a problem. They, and they charge her with assault. Assault. She goes before the judge, and she pleads guilty. She says, yeah, she's guilty. She's calling camera. There's no denying it. She uh, goes before the judge to receive her uh, her, her uh, sentence, and uh, she's facing 90 days in jail. 
90 days in jail. Now, the judge, the Honorable Timothy Gilligan, uh, can't make up that last name, <laughs> he, uh, he says, all right, this is an opportunity to show some, some grace and an opportunity for her to learn something, to learn empathy. And so he, in the sentencing hearing, says, all right, you can either serve the full 90 days and not enjoy the food that you'll receive during that, or we can reduce it down to 30 days, and the rest of your 60 days are spent working in a fast food restaurant. All right? That's some justice. I can get behind that kind of justice. And so here's what he says. He says, do you want to walk in her shoes for two months and learn how people should treat others, or do you want to serve your jail time? Rosemary responds timidly, I'd like to walk in her shoes. I'd like to walk in her shoes. Don't you think that's maybe the heart of what Paul's message is here in Philippians chapter 2? See life from their vantage point. Experience life through the eyes of someone else. Walk a mile in their shoes. And Paul gives the ultimate example of somebody who does that. If you keep reading in verse 5, it says, You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. You see, this is one of the most important real estates in the New Testament because of what it says about who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God, that he is God himself, and that he incarnate, right? He came in the flesh and lived as a human. But We often go to this passage to learn more about who Jesus is, and we forget the context of the passage, and context is king, right? And the context of the passage is that we're supposed to treat others like the way Jesus lived out his life for us. He put on human flesh to understand and know, so God knows what it's like to be human, so that he can be and experience everything that we've experienced. The Hebrews author says that this makes him the perfect sacrifice. We have a Savior who understands. Paul's point is that we should have such empathy that we should live life like Jesus by living life through the eyes of someone else, walking a mile in their shoes. If we were to make this into a, uh, you know, boil this down to a, a point for you note takers, it would mean develop incarnational relationships, right? Develop incarnational relationships. Remember the idea of incarnation, you are living life through the, the eyes, through the, through the shoes, or whatever other metaphor you want to use, of your neighbor. And understanding what life might look like from their vantage point. Suffer when they suffer. Be joyous when, they, when they're joyous. And, and enjoy life with them. You see, obviously that means not throwing your food in someone's face, right? More than that, it's about seeing the inherent value in people. Right? Our founding fathers wrote that all people are in, in, endowed with inalienable rights. Right? Where did they get that from? The Bible, because all people bear God's image. Right? Regardless of how they behave, how they smell, how they live, how they act, all people have inherent value because they bear the image of God. All people are welcome here in this church. All people. And that can make us uncomfortable, and that can be hard to live out. It is come as you are. But it is not remain as you are. See the difference? It's come as you are, but not remain as you are. Now, here's the thing about biblical hospitality. Without the gospel, it is just simply having a dinner party. But when we infuse the gospel into our hospitality, we are endorsing reconciliation or performing the ministry of reconciliation. 
Follow along with me as we see what Paul says about our mission in Colossians chapter 1. Just one book to the right, a couple pages in your Bible. Colossians 1 verse 21 says, And you were at one time strangers and enemies in your minds as expressed through your evil deeds. But now, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy without blemish and blameless before him. If indeed you remain in the faith, established and firm without shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, the gospel that has been preached in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become its servant. You see, endorsing reconciliation is about the work of taking the first step, right? Taking that first step. Elsewhere, uh, um, Paul says that Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 22 here in Colossians 1, but now. But now you are reconciled. You see, God, he does all the work. He even started it while we were his, still his enemies. And there was a, a time in my life before I came to the faith when I was full of selfishness. I was sinful and I was incredibly childish. Though if you ask Erica, I'm still selfish, sinful, and childish. But can you say the same? Can you say that you were perfect before you came to church? Absolutely not. And anyone who does is simply fooling themselves. No, you were changed by your contact with the divine. Who showed you that first step? Who was that first step of reconciliation in your life? Was it your parents who shared their faith with you? Was it a spouse who, who, out of love, talked about their love for Jesus? Was it a friend who invited you to VBS or to a church function? Was it a minister who shared the gospel message with you? Maybe, maybe even for some, that first step is a commercial. Now, Mark talked about the he gets us commercial from the Super Bowl a few weeks ago. We remember there were some provocative images that created some emotional responses. If you remember the commercial, it was a bunch of believers who were washing the feet of what might be described as their social enemies, social opposites. There were many people who came out and criticized the commercial, right? How should we respond to this? And people on both sides, believers, non-believers, both, raised all kinds of criticisms about the commercial. And to be honest with you, there are things to criticize about it. I'm just as critical of gospel presentations as the next one, right? I am a theologian at heart. That's where I live. That's where I feel comfortable with. That's, where I, that's, that's my groove, right? So I can be very critical when it comes to doctrine. But the point of the he gets us ads are about taking that first step towards those who are at odds with us to begin restoring the relationship. After receiving much criticism, the, the organization that puts together the This Is Us, or He Gets Us ads, had this to say on their website. They said, no matter who you are, you are invited to explore the story of Jesus and consider what it means for your life. You are invited to explore the story of Jesus. You see, reconciliation is the work of inviting others to explore the truths of Jesus and the impact those truths can have on the lives of others. The point of reconciliation is being, uh, of, rec of the work of reconciliation is being the one who takes the first step to restore the relationship. And here's the point. Invite others to explore the story of Jesus. 
right? If we're going to endorse reconciliation, then we need to participate in reconciliation, in the ministry of reconciliation, and invite others into the story. Invite others into the story of Jesus and let them come and ask questions. Let them engage the story on their terms, on their life. And I assure you that as they explore that story, they will not remain as they are. So before we criticize how others endorse reconciliation with their commercials, we need to rethink our methods. You see, Paul says in 2 Corinthians that we are to participate in the ministry of reconciliation. So we share. We share Jesus' love with others. We share his invitation. We share his good news. We share his victory over the world. We share that he is king over the world. We share the truth that sin is nothing more than shackling our lives. We share that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We, it is our work to share. It is God's work to transform. When we endorse reconciliation, we invite others into relationship with Jesus. We invite the unwanted who are like the obnoxious children who just want to come and embrace Jesus. So we tell people, come as they are to the story of Jesus and how his gospel of grace can liberate their lives. When people come into contact with the divine, make no mistake, they will be transformed. When people come into contact with the divine, power spills over into the world. And when, God spills, when God's power spills over because of reconciliation, it might look something like revival. In 1857, prayer revival spilled over uh, into our land through the American cities through Jeremiah Lamphere, right? So he was a, a guy who came to ministry late in life. He was a missionary, and he rented a room in the, in the church in Manhattan. And for five months, he goes around and he invites uh, people to his uh, prayer meeting, right? So he's posted the date, spends five months building up for this moment, invites all kinds of people, puts a placard out front, and the placard reads, prayer meeting from 12 to 1 o'clock, stop 5, 10, or 20 minutes, or the whole hour as your time admits. The day finally comes, he's got all the chairs sit in a little circle, he goes into his room in this church in the Manhattan, and he sits down, and nobody comes. He sits there, and 10 minutes go by, no, still nobody comes. Ten more minutes, nobody. He's thinking, did I just waste four months of my life? Uh, maybe feeling kind of stupid about what he's done, about what he's spent his, all of his time and money in. Another ten minutes go by, and finally he can hear the footsteps coming through the door. And the man comes in and sits down. About five or ten minutes later, another man, another businessman comes in off the street, sits down, they're praying. By the end of the hour, six men came in to have prayer with Jeremiah. So he labeled it a success, and they scheduled another prayer meeting, and they went on about their business. He had no way of knowing what would happen next. Within six months, 10,000 businessmen in Manhattan met to have prayer from 12 to 1 o'clock. And it spreads to 20 other locations inside the city of New York. By the next year, it has spread to Chicago, Atlanta, Philadelphia. And then by the next year, it continues to spread. In 1860, it is finally disrupted by the war that breaks out called the Civil War, right? And I want to ask, what would happen if we invite believers to pray for our land? What would happen if we invite people to come and pray? Because for Jeremiah, they estimate one million people came to the faith through these prayer meetings over those years. What would happen if we invite others to see the world through the eyes of their neighbor? What would happen if we did not hinder and instead took the first step of reconciliation? Going back once again, to the words of Jesus in Luke 18, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. 
what would it look like to not hinder the least of these? It might just look like revival. I know that's what I want. Is that what you want? I sure hope so. Let's be a church that expects revival. I want to be a part of a church that expects revival. So when it does come, we are not surprised. So that when it does come, we are prepared, and we will not be a church that gets in the way of itself. We will not stop people from coming, that we will follow the words of Jesus and let the little children come. Let us be a church that expects revival to happen and happen imminently. That will happen soon, and let's pray. Let's pray that revival will come and believe in our hearts that it will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the reconciling king of the world. We love you and are full of gratitude for taking the steps to restore the relationship between us. We ask that you use your Holy Spirit to show us how we can be the hands and feet participating in the work and ministry of reconciliation in the world. Lord, we pray for your spirit to be poured out on our land in our time, and let us be a church ready to receive. Give us the strength and the courage to participate in your mission to save the world. And all God's people said, amen. Well, we've come to that part of the service where it's your opportunity to respond to the worship, to the communion, uh, uh, to the the sermon. And uh, if you need ministry or you would like prayer for your life, Maybe you want to give your life to Christ and, and, uh, and, and, make, and, be, and join in the work of reconciliation, of saving the world with God. If you want to do that, we ask that you just come forward as we all stand and continue worshiping. Would you come? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to 